Hi, it's Kevin again. I know that I promised that last time I'd discuss coffee, geometric optics, string art, and the cardioid. But since then, it's occurred to me that I missed a few facts about the cardioid that will be useful going forward. Besides that, I happen to think that the theorem we'll discuss this time is pretty cool, and it'll give us a little bit more fodder for calculation. So I'm going to go off literally on a tangent here. Follow along with me. Two videos ago, there's a link somewhere nearby, we defined the diameter of a cardioid and started to compare it with the diameter of a circle to show what properties they have in common and what other interesting properties the cardioid has. Just as the diameter of a circle is the length of every chord through the center, the diameter of a cardioid is the length of every chord through the cusp. The circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter. The perimeter of a cardioid is four times the diameter. The area of a circle is one-fourth pi times the diameter. The area of a cardioid is three-eighths pi times the diameter. There are a couple of other facts about diameters that I want to introduce. The tangent lines of a circle at the opposite ends of a diameter are parallel. It turns out that the tangent lines of a cardioid at opposite ends of a diameter have a couple of remarkable properties. If we draw tangents to the cardioid at either end of the diameter, we get perpendicular lines. This fact is interesting enough, but now just about any mathematician would be curious about what the locus of the intersection points might be. It turns out that the locus is a circle. The diameter of the circle is three halves the diameter of the cardioid, and the center of the circle is the center of the original fixed wheel. We'll be seeing the larger circle a lot. So now let's go on and prove this theorem about the tangents. There are much simpler ways to show that the theorem is true, but all of them really are composed after the fact knowing that it's true. I'm going instead to follow the line of reasoning that a mathematician might take in first exploring the problem, and I'm going to make full use of a symbolic algebra system rather than showing all the steps. This is the sort of approach that you might consider in your own mathematical explorations, but I admit that it's a bumpy road, so hang on tight. Let's remember the equation of a cardioid in Cartesian coordinates and make expressions for the two endpoints of the chord. I don't like working with all these trig functions, so I'm going to pull the sneakiest of all the trigonometric substitutions, which gets rid of all the pesky trigonometry. It's called Weierstrass substitution. This is one that I use all the time in computation, and I can't overemphasize how useful it can be. We make a change of variable by introducing a parameter u that we set equal to the tangent of one half theta. This is a really clever choice. By using the half angle, we don't need to keep track of what quadrant anything is in. And everything in a formula turns from trigonometric functions to rational functions. In many cases, the rational functions in an equation can all be placed over a common denominator, so we can turn solving trigonometric equations into finding the roots of polynomials. At the end, if we need to read out the angle, one arctangent gets it back. Dropping all these substitutions in place and grinding through the algebra, as you see, does get rid of all the trigonometry. Since we'll be working with tangent lines, we'll need the derivatives of the coordinates with respect to the parameter, so let's differentiate them now. We write out the equations for tangent lines, and we draw them in on the diagram. Remember that the lines are perpendicular if and only if the inner product of the derivatives is zero. So we expand out the inner products. And when we combine like terms, the inner product does indeed vanish. 
So we've proven the first part of our theorem. The tangents are perpendicular. Like a typical mathematician, I've let my blackboard get pretty cluttered here. Let me clean up a bit and keep only a few of the key facts. The point of intersection has to lie on both the tangent lines. We expand the x and y components out separately, put them over common denominator, and set them equal. The common factors cancel out, and we're left with simultaneous linear equations in P and Q. Solve them however you like. Substitution, Gaussian elimination, Kramer's rule, and you'll discover the final equations for P and Q simplify out considerably. Not a bad result particularly since it gives us the p is 1 over sine theta. Let me tidy up the intermediate work once again. If we plug the formula for p and q back into one of the equations for the tangent lines and simplify, we get some nice rational functions again. And so far all the algebra, while it's been messy, has been pretty straightforward. Substitute a value into an equation and simplify. I took the results pretty much straight out of a computer algebra system, only doing things like reordering terms for presentation. Now I have to be only slightly more clever and work out a way to simplify x further. I could just blindly substitute in theta equals 2 arctan u and then try to sort out the remaining mess of trig functions, but I noticed an easier way as I was playing around with it. Let me tidy up again to make room. I started by noticing that y factored simply into a minus 3 times the double angle side and formula. x was a little bit harder to approach. I noticed the form of the function was pretty similar to cosine squared theta. Does that help? Let me use that to cancel out the u to the fourth term. And yes, that worked. The other term is 2a sine squared theta. Now, guessing from the fact that the locus of points looks like a circle, I started to look for cosine 2 theta to match the sine 2 theta in the y formula. I didn't need to look very far, because in fact any sum of x cos squared theta plus y sine squared theta can be simplified by splitting terms and applying a double angle formula. And so we've built the equations for a circle of diameter 6a centered on the point minus a comma 0, which is what we set out to prove. Let's be a little bit more formal with the terms. What we've been calling the fixed wheel is formally called the in-circle, and the larger circle that we've just been studying is the x-circle, and their common center is the center of the cardioid. So to review, we've learned a few new things about the cardioid. The tangent lines to the cardioid at the endpoints of any diameter are perpendicular. The perpendicular pairs of tangents intersect at points on a circle called the x-circle, which is three times the diameter of the in-circle and concentric with it. And we've had some practice in using Weierstrass substitution, which is the Swiss Army knife of trigonometric substitutions. So next time, I promise I'll start in on string art, geometric optics, and coffee. You'll see this digression was not in vain. We'll be coming back to the X circle again and again. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and keep calculating.